Hey everybody, and welcome back to more Gellin's discussion in my microscopy videos. Man, I am so proud to be able to present this interview to you from last week with Max Morris. I met Max on Facebook several years ago, and she does intuitive public radio. Let me just read you what they say on their website. Intuitive public radio is a multimedia art and advocacy project to promote public health, grow safe communities, and inspire intuitive listening led by survivors of severity and you know being described uh, subscribed on this channel that morgellons is pretty severe max's questions were so compelling and she really opened up my mind to the possibilities we have of being able to cooperate with each other to share ideas and to bridge gaps so that we can avoid those obstacles later in life Please go over to her YouTube channel. I'm going to leave a link in the description below. Give her a subscribe as well. Let her know that what she's doing is highly appreciated. And I hope you guys really enjoy this interview. Take care and we'll see you soon. Hey, Max. Good morning, Jeremy. How are you this morning? I'm doing all right. How are you feeling? Whew. We live in a maelstrom, a whirlwind. Hello. Hello. Hey. It's good to see you. Ah, it's good to see you. It's wonderful to meet you this way. Um, we have interacted in various ways, uh, mostly on Facebook, through a great deal of neurological injuries that I have been experiencing. So my memories of our interactions are yeah. wherever they are. Um, thank you so much for, for making some time for us today. Yeah. What's on your mind, my friend? What, uh, what would you like to accomplish? I have about 25 or 30 minutes of questions or conversation that, that I would be really interested in your reflections for. Um, we, we have these interviews um, firstly as a means of people at the most invisible and violent intersections to have media where they are included in the conversation and and we can experience talking to one another and to others about what is happening for how what's happening for us or what's happening for other people that they may or may not know have to do with our intersections um you for instance know a lot about certain of our intersections um i i i sort of wondered if, if I could ask you how, how you would introduce your broadcasts that you make on a regular basis. Sure, sure, sure. Um, and yeah, I'm fine. Uh, if, uh, do you want to do the interview right now is what you're saying? This Oh, I'm recording. And um, so, so when we ask people for private interviews, yeah. we're, starting, we're starting conversations that we, we usually sort of hope will continue and become many, many conversations in the future. Gotcha. Um, but even, you know, sometimes it ends up being a one-off. And um, even if it does end up being a one-off, our interacting with people is very rare for people in our network. It's very rare for people with the most severe disabilities to have any kind of contact or, or interaction. And so there, there's um, the, the first part of it for us is the neurological repair that is talking with other people because most of us have experienced where severely disabled people really are prevented from communicating with severely disabled people. I was unable to use YouTube yep. for a long time entirely. I have been unable to use Facebook almost altogether. And yeah. it's, um, it's hardcore to not be able to reach the platforms that are, that are taken for granted as, as social connection resources. So um, just, just that piece is such a huge thing. And then because you are doing so many different media projects, um, I, I'm, I was really delighted to find you on Telegram um, because Telegram is where we do a lot of collaborating in regards to media projects. So um, that's super neat. And um, there are so many things that I would talk about. I they can't all fit through my face at the same time, but I have some <laughs> about questions. Okay. Um, so yeah, like um, uh, it did give you a recording um, notification, right? Did it tell you that I was recording? 
Yeah. Yeah. It told me you were recording okay. and uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's great. I would love to answer any questions that uh, you have for me. And regarding your first question, uh, it depends on what uh, medium I'm on. Like for example, on BitChute, I've got a show called, ah, uh, shoot, Morgulons. And uh, my show on Anchor FM is uh, Morgellons Discussion on Anchor FM. And then on YouTube, I've got Morgellons Discussion and Microscopy videos. So I try to keep them unique between each, uh, each venue, uh, but also try to appeal to the audience that's on that venue. You know, for example, on TikTok, I have a lot of goofy videos, but I also weave a lot of social commentary into those. And so I keep people entertained. Uh, because that's what they're really on TikTok for. They don't want to get on there and get hammered with, you know, a message, socially conscious message every single day. They're usually there just to chill out during the lunch break or whatever. So try to keep the content that I'm producing for each of those mediums unique to uh, what kind of audience would appeal to, to that kind of content. I, I had noticed that you pronounce Mor Morgellons, Morgellons, Morgellons differently. Like periodically you change the way you pronounce it. And that appeals mm -hmm. to me a lot. I like um, pronunciations of words and, and differences in languaging. I, I'm curious why you, or, I mean, if you have ever thought about why, why you pronounce it all of the different ways. Well, the community, the Morgellons community pronounces it in various ways already. Uh, it seems seems like the physicians and that are treating it and the scientists that are researching it pronounce it with the soft G, the Morgellons, and the community, the patients themselves typically uh, utilize the hard G, the Morgellons. There was a, a, a podcast episode uh, of a, a couple of guys who reported on the Morgellons condition, and they looked it up, and there was an audio synthesizer that told them how to pronounce it. And that audio synthesizer pronounced it Morgulons. And, and so the first time I heard that, it was actually crystal clear on Anchor FM who was using that. The name of her show is More Morgulons on Anchor FM. So that's where I picked up the uh, pronouncing it that way with the three, uh, with the syllables separated and enunciated in that fashion. Uh, and on my bit shoot channel, I just uh, added a soft G to that pronunciation, the Morgulons. It really assists neurological function, as far as I'm concerned, pronouncing <laughs> things different ways. Um, you, you said something, um, you, we, we were driving in a car with you last, something we watched, um, and you, you mentioned, you, you, you say, you've said a few times, nothing special about Morgellons. Right. And that, could you unpack that to, to some extent? Absolutely. Yeah. The thing is, is that when the media started covering Morgellons, they were associating it with the possibilities, what a lot of people thought Morgellons was really all about. A lot of people really wanted Morgellons to justify their cult topic interest. If they were into chemtrails, they wanted Morgellons to make chemtrails real for everybody. If they're into aliens, they wanted this Morgellons to make people finally understand that aliens were real. They want the Morgellons to accomplish that for them. So when the science finally hit that Morgellons was just really tissue damage from bacterial infection, most people rejected that because it didn't support what they wanted Morgellons to be. I wrote an article called The Exploitation of Morgellons about this, where you have different groups that take the term and not necessarily the scientific definition, and they exploit it uh, to try to propel their own uh, cult topic interest. So you have a lot of people that are into GMO, forcing transhumanism. You have a lot of people that are into the... Um, Alien, the angels and the demons and Mark Allen's really isn't anything spiritual or sensational. It is literally tissue damage from bacterial infection. Hi, um, there are a few different, there are a few different things that we have written down that is connected to this. One of them was that um, we, we keep saying, um, you mentioned studies, you, you quote from a lot of interesting studies ongoing. And one of the things that we keep saying is, we need Jeremy to have more access to studies. We want you to have more access to the studies that you are able to read part of, but not more of. And the, the, the circumstance with medical literature is that stuff is behind a paywall or stuff is behind, a, I mean, like I don't, these, these academic sort of, um, you have to have a really expensive kind of academic subscription kind of thing 
in order to access them. I wondered, I wondered if you would comment on any of that. I don't, it's really not necessary with the amount of open access information that we have. Uh, once you read, a lot of people, they like to cite those studies. They'll go around and say there are 16 peer-reviewed scientific studies that show Morgellons is associated with an infectious process. But what they're not saying, what they're not demonstrating is a profound understanding of that research. When you go through it, you'll see exactly the processes that result in the Morgellons condition. You'll understand what the fibers are comprised of. You'll get an idea based on what other, uh, what other research is cited in those papers about what could potentially be going on pathologically with Morgellons to get a clear idea of the whole picture. Once you have that in mind, once you see what evidence has been demonstrated, then all the other ideas become less viable to you because you understand, okay, well, that doesn't make sense because Morgellons fibers originate inside the body and not outside the body. That excludes a whole train of thought, a whole crowd of people who believe that they're breathing in these things and that they're coming out their skin, even if they don't have sores or any uh, evidence of microscopic filaments embedded in their skin tissue. Morgellons patients can uh, present without sores, but typically that's where it becomes concerning for them. Uh, and that's where the, the fibers are discovered. Like myself, I didn't even know what Morgellons was long before I'd started developing the fibers and the sores. And the fibers never bothered me. It was always the sores. Mm -hmm. um, I, the, so like, I, I think there's a lot of frustration in, in our community network about um, how information is shared through studies and that there is a lot that feels artificially or unnecessarily limited in terms of the way that that information is shared. And one of, one of the things that we have noticed is that we really benefit from your explanations or you linking, you know, this to that, um, where, where it, it's like, um, it's, it's an accessibility point of, of human conversation yeah. So like our brains can understand it better if we're talking about it in some way. And there, there, there's sort of this, there's this desire to hear you explain things in more depth. If you, if you have more access to more information, then you can help us understand <laughs> more of what's going on. Yeah. I, you know, I don't think I'm more informed than anybody else necessarily. Um, I get uh, computers are a good example. You know, most people nowadays understand how to tear apart a computer and put one together, you know, and the same way that maybe our parents, uh, 30 years ago knew how to tear down a car engine and put it back together. That's just something that we were into. It's something that's logical. And when you tinker with it for long enough, you start developing an understanding, uh, Morgellons research, what's publicly available is similar. You know, if you just break it down a little bit at a time and take a look at each piece of information that's contained in the whole study, then over time, you'll start to develop a full understanding of, of what the, what's really there, what evidence is, is available and, and what that leaves out in terms of possibilities. Do you, uh, do, do you feel like you can work that way with the studies where, you, you can't see all of it, but you can see a, a small amount of the information in the study. Like, do you feel, do you feel like it's sufficient for that process or do you feel like there should be more? I, I, I get the sense that you are aware of more open information than, than I am, than we are. It's been very hard for us to find. Well, I mean, we, many of us cannot even load websites. We can't, I can't necessarily see what I'm looking at. I can't necessarily, like my eyes work but the neurological connective process depends on my body having enough support for my neurology to function for my sensory sure. stuff to clear up. Um, and so like we, we barely have access to that, but then um, it's, it's so helpful if there are people just talking about it around us, because then we have a chance to neurologically connect with a particular study or, or so on. But um, I, if you are aware of there being a lot more open information, that's especially cool. I don't know if I'm interpreting what you said correctly. Yeah, no, I understand what you're saying about that. I think that the, I, th 
I think that the information is available, but I don't think there's enough people discussing it openly, like you're saying. I think that that personal association is really does help people process it better. Uh, because you can take a scientific study and print out all 16 pages of it, but you're not going to have any kind of a personal connection with it. But if you have two people that are online that are talking about specific aspects of it, like, hey, did you see how these blue fibers are colored that way because of the melanin pigmentation they found in the chemical composition? You can have a whole conversation about that. How did the melanin get in there? How many fibers uh, were blue? Do you have any blue fibers? I get blue fibers all the time. And then that's a thing. That's an experience that two people can share with each other. And that makes it a personal and reinforces the information that they're discussing. Yeah, that's huge, especially when, when there's so much gaslighting. Um, and people, uh, people at our intersections in, in these particularly extreme situations um begin to doubt what they're even experiencing like a, the very core of it like are, are, are it, it completely it can completely dismantle one's sense of oneself and and one's ability to discern one's environment or or what's happening for for one's body yeah. and that's such a a massive experience to even start to try to communicate but to not to not have anyone to interact with on the level of that real reality. Yeah, the information is publicly available. It's just people have to take an interest in it. You know, one thing that I've done to try to, uh, uh, to try to generate more interest is with the ether morgue. You know, I sent you some cryptocurrency yes. a couple of and so that it's a way to gamify the process. You know, if you give people an incentive, they go, oh, I could win something free. You know, even if there's if it's no tangible worth, it's just, an, uh, you know, an emotional uh, prize, uh, something that they value. Kind of like when you're playing a video game and, you know, like Super Mario Brothers and then you get the mushroom. The mushroom makes you bigger. You can stop on enemies. You can get hit one time and you're not going to die there's no real value in that. It just makes you feel good to have that. It's a piece of software that made you feel a certain way. And that's kind of the way the ether morgue works. If I see a couple of people talking about particulars of a Morgellon study, I'm going to award them, you know, five ether morgue each just for talking about it. And I go, wow, I better talk about this again in the future. I could win <laughs> something else. And then if we have a store online where they can redeem something of tangible value for those ether morgues, then that makes it even more, that gives them even more incentive to share even more. They can go to the store and they could buy a guitar signed by Randy Wymore. Does, does this exist now? No, no, we're developing it now. I, and I need some help. You know, if you know some people who like to work on cryptocurrency projects, we'd definitely like to get Morgellons coin and Nathan Morg off the ground. I oh, had a more. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. The um so so have you have you sort of just begun the process of having a store where people can can purchase things with with ether is it ether morgue? Am I saying it right? Yeah, there are two cryptocurrencies. There's Morgellons coin, which is hopefully going to raise funds for scientific research, and there's ether morgue, which is going to provide incentive for people to share and discuss the research uh, that is published. Currently, there is not a store available. Uh, what I'm working on presently is a mechanism to be able to award people uh, and to give people the ability to ward each other on social media with these ether morgues. So say, for example, uh, I see you on Twitter posting a scientific research paper about Morgellons. I want to be able to issue a command under that tweet that says, Morgellons tip, uh, tip max 300 ether morgue. And then the Morgellons tip bot comes back and says, okay, we just sent max 300 ether morgue. You click on the link to check your online wallet. And there it is the 300 ether morgue that I tipped you. And then you see somebody on Twitter the next day and they've posted a different study. You can go Morgellons tip, tip, uh, Sam 200 ether morgue. And then, Morgellons bot comes back and says, okay, we just sent Sam 200 ether morgue. You check your wallet. You only have a hundred left. Sam goes and checks his wallet. He's got 200 ether morgue right there. Everybody's a winner. That's wild. Is that like, um, is it, it sort of, 
does it require people to already be registered in a system sort of to, to receive it? Or could it be a link that they then they register themselves after they receive it? Kind of, I don't know if that makes sense. What I'm saying. It's the latter. It's the latter. There, there's a link that they, it's just waiting for them until they register. And once they get registered, then they've claimed it. I love that a lot. I look forward to, to hopefully supporting the, the evolution of that in some way. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's an exciting opportunity. We just like to get it off the ground, but it's going to take people, you know, the people have to get interested. And oftentimes with these cryptocurrency projects, it's just one or two people. It's, it's not a group of people. That's why these coins oftentimes fail because they just don't have the manpower behind them uh, to get them anywhere. The whole cryptocurrency has been a very interesting recurring topic, and it's been very, very, very challenging. Um, I, so many of us have really severe neurological injuries, particularly left hemisphere function um, issues of one kind or another. And so money and numbers and um, altogether economic participation is a real subject. And especially when our experiences and, and, and the, the whole gaslighting situation really changes the way we express ourselves or communicate yeah. um, as individuals. And it really changes uh, how we are received or perceived in, in any particular environment. If in fact we can reach an environment, uh, many of us are, are digital only because we cannot, we're so sensitive, we, we cannot go to to another, another building or interact with people. But then of course, many of us have such EMF sensitivities that interacting digitally can also be impossible or almost impossible. So it's, yeah. I mean, any, any, any small way of interacting with others connects immediately to potential for recovery or economic participation or any means of surviving or having a community. Um, we we appreciate that you you talk about the community. You talk about being a community. You talk about showing up as a community. It takes a yeah. community to solve certain kinds of problems. Well, Morgellons in particular, the community is especially fragmented. There's no evidence that EMF sensitivity is associated with Morgellons. This new study, what it's suggesting is that some Morgellons patients who do experience EMF sensitivity may be harboring some kind of bacterial species that is particularly conducive or conductive uh, or has some kind of electrical properties that has been demonstrated. It's not saying that Morgellons patients are going to be able to, you know, perform, uh, you know, like X-Men style capabilities, but uh, there's the potential that if there's some kind of really bizarre symptom that the patient is concerned about and the doctor sees evidence that, okay, this patient has a bacterial species that is demonstrated to have these really odd properties. So maybe, who knows, maybe that's the, an explanation for it. Not entirely conclusive at all, but uh, just something that says there are weird bacteria with strange properties and some patients may be harboring those species. Some bacteria eat and shit electricity. Yeah, that's true. That, that's very true. I think that's one of the most interesting things I ever ran across. No. Uh, I, I, uh, I've been a fan of that, just that realization. And periodically we just repeat some bacteria eat and shit. Some microbes eat and shit electricity like yeah. that. There are so many implications of that. Um, the, 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 whole, um, the whole psychiatric misdiagnosis thing and listening to the body being this subject of, of, you know, we're, we're having all of these different experiences and knowing how to interpret them, especially in isolation can be a wild experience. Um, the, the, could you say anything about, about your experience of the dichotomy between, um, you know, we have these structures of expertise, stru professional structures and academic structures. And, and then we have, um, you know, honoring living beings, um, listening to our bodies, uh, believing in our bodies, um, tuning in well enough to our bodies, because we're really the only ones who can, who can get accurate information about what's happening to our bodies. Oh, that's professional. So it's, um, 
Yeah, that's it. what we can provide is insight for the professionals to try to figure out what is wrong with this. The problem is that these uh, the doctors that you go to, they may not be required to accomplish a thorough examination to rule out a lot of possibilities. They're not required to have updated information about contemporary realities of infectious disease. Um, I just interviewed the mental health master on my YouTube channel. You may have seen that. You may have not. I'll send you a link so you can check it out. Mm-hmm. We talk about that, how a lot of patients who with these bacterial infections get caught up in the psychiatric system when they're not supposed to be there in the first place, but they're there because their infections have resulted in behavioral concerns. Lyme disease is one of many infections that can alter a person's behavior. And it can impair their mental cognition and capabilities. Uh, You know, getting on treatment in 2017, it started finally becoming effective around 2018. I had an aha moment where my doctor added an antibiotic to my combination. The the instant she did that, the low-lying level of aggression I'd experienced my entire life completely evaporated. I was able to start to want to uh, cooperate with people more easily. I was more easily able to accept their opinion, accept them as individuals. Whereas before I was pretty standoffish, kind of a loner. Uh, I wanted to do everything on my own. Uh, but this really changed my mind. This changed how I operated. It really improved my personality. But I left, I was left feeling, uh, I was left feeling like I'd been, like I'd been, uh, like I'd missed out my entire life on living the person who I was always capable of being, but because I harbored this infection, this hidden disease, uh, and a lot of people and most people, it's asymptomatic. They carry this infection around their entire lives and uh, never have any visible kind of symptoms uh, until one day it's the virulence is activated and they just kill over dead. I think a lot of people experience the same kind of situation where their mental capacity is impaired by these hidden infections that doctors are not necessarily trained to rule out. They may have a lot of anxiety, but going to a psychiatrist and several psychiatrists throughout the years over and over again, getting on the same medicines, uh, the same treatments that have always failed previously. At that point, it's time to look at Lyme disease, but because Lyme disease is so stigmatized, people are often afraid to break out of that cycle. The insurance company, they're not going to cover the doctor. The insurance company will cover the treatments. Uh, You know, the Affordable Care Act covers all of my long-term combination antibiotics for chronic Lyme disease. A lot of people aren't even aware of that because they want to get into the situation where they're complaining more about the system than taking advantage of the good they can get out of it to get well. That's something that I, I think the, the community is especially fragmented about is wanting to throw blame at these federal government agencies. The CDC, when you go on their website, they're accurate about what they're saying about Lyme disease. And they say, if you're thinking about going on long-term antibiotics, discuss the risk with your doctor. They don't say, no, don't do that. We're going to find your doctor and throw him in jail. They go discuss it with them. Because it is something that may help you, you know, they don't say that, but they say, you know, there are risks and you can discuss it with your doctor and the Affordable Care Act covers those antibiotics. But people get focused on vengeance. They get focused on being angry about what they missed out on instead of taking the time that they have left to live the life that they could be living. So that's where I speak out about a lot of these groups and a lot of these advocacy movements, which concentrate on just hating the CDC, hating the IDSA, hating the American Psychiatric Association, just putting all their energy day in and day out, waking up and just hating these things when they could get up every day and be planting a garden, going for a walk around the block, you know, sending their best friend a card, asking them what's up and, you know, maybe take him mom out somewhere nice to eat. There's, there's other things to do than just getting up and being hateful all day. There's a lot to be said for giving professional networks opportunities to improve and change for, for the benefit of all. And I, I think, I mean, the, there, is, there is this 
increasing collective trauma kind of thing going on. Like a lot of people are experiencing hardship where they didn't before. And it, yeah. there, it's, it's becoming a more common experience to recognize how one is affected by some kind of invisible violence, some kind of invisible hardship. And um, it, it's sort of like we need to help one another maintain the knowledge of how to how to give one another opportunities to be better rather than assuming that that something means that 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 um, well, well, you know, it's the end of the world. In a lot of cases, it, it's been the end of our neurology. Like if we don't have community resourcing, can we even communicate in a way that is not angry, for instance, especially if we have a, a health condition that is affecting how, how, our, how our emotions are and that can be so intense. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that we have really valued and I really appreciate talking about here is where we, we interact with one another to create more and better inclusive community resources and all of us benefit neurologically and all of us can interact with different mainstream systems, health systems in, in ways that allow us to discover the amazing people who are part of those systems, who, who themselves probably aren't very happy about how those systems work and would love to make that so much better with, with, with understanding and communication and collaborators. Yeah. I mean, when you look around, you know, even people in your own family are able to do well, you know, uh, people that, you know, people you went to school with, they're able to do well. And oftentimes they may be facing similar adversities. You know, they may be dealing with cancer directly. They may be dealing with uh, paralysis or something serious that has inhibited their full potential, but they've still been able to get the resources together. I think often the problem is that it's with the individual. In my case, it was my fault because the infection was in a lot of ways, preventing my ability to cooperate with people to achieve that success. I think those networks are in place, but because of our illness, a lot of people have a hard time opening up and reaching out and accepting that kind of help, accepting that kind of cooperation, or even knowing what to ask for, knowing what to need, or being able to manage it properly when they get it. You know, I've received a lot of opportunities that I just kind of pissed off along the way because my mind wasn't working right. I didn't have my shit together. But when you get with a compatible doctor who does start to make a difference in your life, then you can move forward, open up to getting that help and the cooperative capabilities that's going to be able to progress you in life. Since I got on responsible treatment, I've been working with so many new groups and new people and new entities. And it's, it's a life expanding experience because really the answers all aren't inside yourself but you can look outside yourself for inspiration. I, I really appreciate the vibration about, about doctors, about professional networks, about, about finding the, the people you can work with really well. And I, I would also really love to bring in, um, and we only have a few more minutes, but maybe we can talk again. Maybe I could reach yeah. out to you on Telegram. I would be so grateful. Um, the, the, if we could maybe say something in our last few minutes for um, people who are not able to reach medical resources, people who are never able to see a doctor, people who who just and there are a lot of those people and we um, it's very hard to know how to navigate that in that kind of extremity, but we're building bridges. I wonder if you, if you have some reflections we could use to help build our bridges. Yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, if you, if you do want to try to see a doctor and you want to get some financial assistance, I've got a page on my website with a list of resources to be able to find a doctor and to be able to get financial assistance to pay for those therapies. Uh, there are about three, two or three resources for finding a physician, three resources for finding a physician, and about a dozen resources on the link that I include for finding financial assistance. If you're dealing with Lyme disease or infectious diseases that are long-term, there are a lot of resources that you can tap into uh, to try to petition to get some financial assistance. If you have kids with Lyme disease, there are uh, uh, foundations available that, can, that grant people with funds all the time to be able to offset the costs of their kids having to get medical assistance for Lyme disease. 
so if you go on my website, www. Can I say it, Max? Oh, please. It okay? <laughs> uh, there's a link right up top that says doctors. You click on that and it's got a list of resources for being able to find a physician and getting financial assistance, hopefully to be able to offset those costs. Can you say any of your other links so that people can find you and follow you most easily? Anything that comes to mind? Yeah, I'm on Cointree, uh, C-O-I-N-T-R dot E-E slash Morgellons. That has every single link of my social uh, uh, online presence. It's got my Twitter, my Facebook, my LinkedIn, the YouTube, the BitChute, the Daily Motion, all that stuff's on there. So if you want to try to get a hold of me, the, there's no better way but the coin tree, C O I N T R dot E E slash Morgellons. Does that also have ways to support you with, with through donations or, or similar for anyone who might have, find themselves in a position to do so? That's right. If you go to Cointree, C-O-I-N-T-R dot E-E slash Morgellons, it's got my PayPal, my Cash App, my Venmo. You can send me Bitcoin, Cardano, Ethereum, uh, Hex. You, know, you can send me all sorts of money on there. Got it all covered. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, Thanks for the opportunity, too. Thank you. And um, I will stay in touch on, on Telegram. We have a lot of groups on Telegram. I, 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 maybe I'll tell you something about them and, and invite you and um, we can chat yeah. again on Zoom when, when we have an opportunity. Yeah, I would love to do this again. This was a great, great uh, chance to be able to speak about what's really going on with our society today. Thank you. I hope your day is wonderful. You too, my friend. All right. Take care. See you soon. Bye-bye.